right guys, um, it's Professor Williams and I'm going to do a review or an overview of these measures of central tendency for ungrouped data. So we're going to be dealing with the mean, the median, the mode, some percentiles, some deciles, and some quartiles. So hang on to your hats and off we go. Okay, and what I have is I have got 24 pieces of data. Um, and where I got that was not from Professor Math, but I'm using the numbers from problem 3.7 on page 54 of the black textbook. The first thing I did was I actually cheated. Um, I turned around and I typed all of these values into Excel and then I'd simply hit the sort key and you'll see that I have them sorted from smallest to largest. The other thing that I did that just helped me help you is I added this column that says position and what that does is it just says that this number is in the fourth position. It's just going to keep me from doing a lot of counting um, because it's still kind of early in the morning. So um, these are over here are simply the position or the place that each of these values or X occupies in the data set. So I'm going to begin by calculating the mean of the data, in this case mu. Remember that the mean of the data set is really nothing more than the arithmetic average. So I'm simply going to come over, I'm going to add all of my values, sum of x, so I'm going to add all of these up, I'm then going to divide them by n, in this case we know that we have 24 data points, in order to come up with the average or the mean of the data set. Alright, so now <clears throat> I have added all of those values together and I get 3,083 is the sum of X. And I'm simply going to take that and divide that by the 24 data points that I have. And I'm going to round off and I'm going to come up with 128.46. So the mean, mu, or X bar, depending upon whether it's sample or population data, is 128.46. So that one was pretty easy. Now let's find the median of the data set, because remember the median is the center, not necessarily a value, but if I take these 24 data points and I fold them in half, I want to see what number, what value appears at the crease. So taking a look at how to locate the median, we're going to move into the data and start looking at positions. Okay, we have two, really two ways to do this. Um, I can simply know that I have 24 data points. 24 divided by 2 is 12. Except I also know that I have an even number. And so if I simply pick the 12th observation, then that doesn't give me half here and half here. I end up with one more on this side of the median than I do here. So I simply take the middle two values. And when I take those middle two values, I'm going to take the 12th and the 13th value, because now I have the exact same number, <coughs> excuse me, above the mean or above the median and below the median. And so in order to find that median, I'm simply going to split the difference to find the true center. So what I've done, <clears throat> again, is I went to my 12th and my 13th value, and I said 127 plus 128, and remember I want the middle, the median, divided by 2. That's simply going to give me the location that's in the center of those two data points 
gives me 127.5, which means that the median of this data set is 127.5. It's a number that doesn't appear in the data, but if I were to fold these in half, what I would find is that is the true center of the data set. Remember, we can also, um, especially if I have large data sets, I can also approach it with this philosophy of n plus 1 divided by 2. Well, I've got 24 observations, which is my n, which is here, plus 1 gives me 25, and I'm going to divide it by 2. So what I end up with is when I take 25 and I divide it by 2, even I can do that math, I come up with 12.5. Now remember that 12.5 is not the median. This is the location of the median. So I'm going to come down and I'm going to find location 12. And I'm going to go halfway between 12, so it's actually at position 12.5, which is right here. Location 12.5 is right here, which gives me again 127.5. It's unlikely that you will ever have to use this approach because I don't force you all to deal with extremely large data sets. And when we're talking data, large data sets, we're talking data sets that have an excess of 100, 150 values. But if it's confusing you in the textbook when he's talking about this n plus 1 divided by 2, remember that's simply the way of locating the position, the 12.5 fifths, or however you pronounce that, location in the data set to then determine where you're going to be. All right? So that's mean and median for our 24 data points. Let's see what else we have. All right, so now we're going to look at the mode. <clears throat> Remember, the mode is simply the most common, and we have three choices. We can be unimodal, one mode, bimodal, two modes, multimodal, more than two modes. So let's look over here at our potential suspects for the mode of the data set. What I'm going to do is I'm simply going to move through and I'm going to start locating anything that repeats. And because they're ordered, it's easy for me to tell. All right, 116 is there twice. All of these are individual. 138 is there twice. All these guys are individual. So, I have 116 and 138 both repeat themselves and since they both appear twice, I don't have anybody who's better or more common than the other, what I'm going to end up with is two modes, which makes this a bimodal data set. And when I report the mode, I'm simply going to report back that the mode is equal to 116 and, whoops, and... 138, which equals a bimodal data set, except I can't spell this morning. That needs an A. Right? So it's bimodal. It's bimodal because I, again, I have <coughs> both 116 and 138 that repeat twice, and that's all there is to finding a mode. So <coughs> we have mean, median, and mode. The other thing that we have to deal with in terms of uh, measures of central location are quartiles, remember quarters, percentiles, hundreds or pennies, and deciles, dimes or tens. So let me flip to a different sheet and let's roll and find some uh, percentiles, deciles, and quartiles. I know you can't wait. All right, let's take a look at percentiles or, and quartiles. Remember that because percentiles separate everything, all data sets, into a hundred, we can represent, we can determine the percentile location for for any place in our data set. In this case, we're going to look for P20, 20th percentile, P30, 
and P83. And we're going to apply this formula up here. I, remember, location is simply the percentile I'm looking for, which in this case right here, it's a bad looking arrow, will be 20. And N, remember, is simply the number of observations I have. In this case, way down here at the bottom, I have 24. So I'm going to go ahead and locate this 20th percentile for you to start. Okay, so I've simply substituted in and I've said that P20 is located at 20 divided by 100 times 24. And according to my math genie, my math genie tells me that 24 times 0 0.20 is 4.8. Except that we don't have a 4.8 in terms of a location over here. So what we're going to end up doing is I'm going to end up rounding up. So if I round 4.8 up, according to me, I'm going to round up to 5, which means that P20 is located at the fifth term. The fifth term is 107 and when I interpret that what I'm saying is the 20th percentile 107 means that only 20 percent of the data falls below a value of 107. I know it's weird because I'm saying below but it looks like I'm going up but look at these values all of these values are smaller than 107. All those values are, one oh, are smaller than 107. So the 20th percentile, or location I, tells me the value below which, below, below which 20% of the values fall. Here I'm not talking about the number of values, I'm talking about the quantity. So let's go on and find P47. All right, so I've done the same thing here. I simply substituted in and I said I want P47. And that goes right here. That's my P. Still have the same 24 data points. So I'm looking for percentile 47 in my 24 um, observation data set. And the result is is that 24 times 0.47 is 11.28. Well, again, I don't have an 11.28, so I'm simply going to round up, and I'm going to round it up, and I'm going to get 12. So I'm going over here, and this is why I cheated and um, numbered my values, and at the 12th location is 127. So what I now know is that P47 is 127. So 47% of the data values in this array have values less, have values less than 127. All right, let's go on and do P83, which we already now should know is going to fall further down the line. And when we fall further down the line, our numbers are increasing, so we know it's going to be a bigger value. All right, so now I've got done my math, and I've, set, I've substituted in 83 as my percentile, still my 24 data points. So what I'm actually going to end up with is 0.83 times 24 gives me 19.92. But by this point, you should be kind of getting the idea that I'm not going to the 19.92 location. I'm going to round it up. Just going to round this up to 20. Ooh, that's terrible writing. I'm coming into my data set. I'm going to find my location of the 20th value. And it's going to tell me that the 83rd percentile is located at 145 which means that 
83% of the data values are smaller than 145, which basically means that the other 17% are larger. All right. So now we have P20, P47, and P83. Let's go down and do Q1, Q2, and Q3, because remember, there's no such thing as Q4. All right, Q1. Remember that Q1 is the same thing as P25. One quarter is 25 pennies. So I'm going to simply use the exact same formula I used up here. I'm still using, I'm pretty much using the same formula for all of this. And I'm going to take 0.25 times 24. And in this case, 0.25 times 24 is going to give me a value of 6. Well, because this is a whole number, right, because this is a whole number, I'm going to have to go and split the difference. So I'm going to come one more value up. So I'm coming to the sixth and the seventh value because Q1 actually falls in between these two. Well, how do I find the number that's in between those two? You all already know the answer to that. Alright, so I came over here, I found my sixth term and I went one more to my seventh. I ended up with 112 and 116. And remember, I want to split the difference. So I'm going to take 112 plus 116, divide it by 2. I come up with 114. And so Q1 is located at the value of 114. Remember, even though that doesn't that number doesn't appear in my data set. It is the location that separates the lowest 25% of my values from the highest 75% of my values. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so remember finding Q2 is the same thing as finding P50. It's also the same thing as finding the median of the data set. So I'm going to take 50 divided by 100 times 24 is going to give me 12. Again, it's a whole number. So I'm going to go to the 12th value in my data set. But remember, I'm looking for the middle. So I'm going to go up one. I'm going to take 127 and 128, and I know that Q2, or the median in that data set, actually falls at the 12.5 place. So again, I'm going to take the 127, the 128, I'm going to move them over here, add them together, divide them by 2, I'm going to come up with 127.5, and so the location of Q2 is 127.5 which means that the same amount of data falls below and above a value of 127.5. If I folded this data set in two, I'd have the exact same number, exact quantity of data here and here. Remember, I'm going to fold that data set in two, and the number 127.5 would theoretically fall in the crease of my piece of paper. So let's find Q3. Okay, so remember that Q3 is the same thing as three quarters. Three quarters is the same thing as 75 pennies. So 75 divided by 100 gives me 0 0.75. 0 0.75 times 24 gives me 18. Well, again, I've got a whole number. So I'm going to come over here and find the 18th position, and I know that I've got to go in between the two because it's an even number. So I'm going to take 143 and 144, bring them over here, divide them by 2, and I now know that Q3 is located right in between these two, and it appears at 143.5.
So now I've located the 20th, 47th, and 83rd percentile. I now have Q1, Q2, and Q3. And the last thing I'm going to do while I have you on quartiles is IQR. Remember, the interquartile range. And although this is a measure of variability, since I've got this stuff up here right now, I can go ahead and, and calculate it for you. In order to find the interquartile range, we simply look at Q1 and Q3. And I'm going to take I'm going to take Q3 minus Q1 because I can't end up with a negative number. So let me show you what that looks like. All right, so I'm simply going to take Q3 minus Q1. So I knew Q3 was 143.5, Q1 was 114, and I end up with an interquartile range of 29.5. Look at what this does in terms of giving me the middle of my data set. I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to find where Q1 lies. Well, Q1 lies at 114, which is halfway in between here. Q3 at 143.5 runs right here. Now look what's happened. Now the, this is the interquartile range. In other words, this is how far it is, and this becomes the center. This is truly the center or the middle of my data set. Because how many data points do I have below it? Well, I've got these right here, and according to me, that's six. How many do I have outside of the IQR? I have six. So this becomes the interquartile range, and because I know that it's between 143.5 to 114, I have an IQR of 29.5, and now what I've done is I have eliminated the possibility or the influence of extremely low or extremely high data values from my data set. And the IQR becomes very useful when we begin to try and isolate outliers or, as somebody told me this morning, a green kangaroo at the zoo. So, hope this helps. If not, let me know and you guys have an awesome day.